I have never seen a human being eat in such a disgusting fashion. You ever see it? He's eating today, stuffing it. I never saw. This guy takes a pancake and he's shoving it in his mouth. He's like, Thank you, guys. Bites this big. Thank you, guys. It's not a big deal. He's pushing it in. We never saw a guy eat like this. I told my son, he was watching. He said, Daddy, look. I said, don't watch. Little bites, little bites. It's disgusting. Do you want that for your president? I don't think so. Okay, I gotta eat now. It's about. Why don't some other people eat? Are you eating? I have never seen a human being eat in such a disgusting fashion. You ever see it? He's eating today, stuffing it. I never saw. This guy takes a pancake and he's shoving it in his mouth. He's like, Thank you, guys. Bites this big. Thank you, guys. It's not a big deal. He's pushing it in. We never saw a guy eat like this. I told my son. He was watching. He said, Daddy, look. I said, don't watch. Little bites, little bites. It's disgusting. Do you want that for your president? I don't think so. Okay, I gotta eat now. It's about. Why don't some other people eat? Are you eating? I don't know how to break this deal. <laughs> Donald Trump is very upset. It's very hard for him to deal with. I don't know what his relationship with women has been in his life, but he has discovered that women go to the bathroom. And it's been very upsetting for him. And this is what I quote. Now, I was there at the debate we had on Saturday night. But I gotta be honest with you. I gotta be honest with you. Gotta lay it out on the table. I also went to the bathroom. I know. I know. I have to admit it. I, I guess I'm a man. Men are allowed to go to the bathroom, but women, what can we say? And this is the quote. I, I mean, this is the pathology. This is the guy who is leading in the Republican polls. This is what he said Quote, I know where she went. It's disgusting. This is Hillary Clinton going to the bathroom. This is the issue. It's disgusting. I don't want to talk about it. No, it's too disgusting. Don't say it. It's disgusting. This is a guy who wants to be president of the United States. He must have a very unusual relationship with women. So what we, I think, have to do is to defend the Affordable Care Act and fix it. And I want to share a quick story to tell you why this is so important to me. This is a letter from someone who's here. And she gave me this letter. I think that I can read about it. She has to take a brand name drug. She's been taking it since the early 1980s. At that time, back in the 1980s, for the same drug, it cost approximately $180 for 10 shots. The latest refill she received from her pharmacy was $14,729.99 for the same 10 vials. And the company is one of these companies that is absolutely gouging American consumers and patients. It's called Valiant Pharmaceuticals. I'm going after them. We are going to stop this. This is predatory pricing. It is unjustified. It is wrong. And we're going to make sure it is stopped. He has taken politics to a new place with his negative branding of people, whether it's saying Jeb Bush is low energy <laughs> or talking about Lion Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. um, and for his supporters, it's really, it's really worked. He has lately taken to calling you, I believe, corrupt mm -hmm. Hillary, and he's had some rather personal and pointed tweets. Have you learned anything from watching the way that Republicans dealt with him in the primaries that will inform how you will deal with such an unconventional candidate? Well, you know, remember, I, um, 
I have a lot of experience dealing with men who sometimes get off the reservation and the way they behave and how they speak. Uh, I'm not gonna deal with their temper tantrums or their bullying or their efforts to try to provoke me. He can say whatever he wants to say about me. I could really care less. I'm gonna stand up for what I think the American people need and want in the next president. That's why I've laid out very specific plans. There's nothing secret about what I wanna do with the economy, with education, with healthcare, with foreign policy. I've laid it all out there. And he can't, or he won't, I can't tell which. Um, so we're gonna talk about what we wanna do for the country and he can continue on his insult fest, but that's the choice he's making. After a major terrorist attack, every society faces a choice between fear and resolve. The world's great democracies can't sacrifice our values or turn our backs on those in need. Therefore, we must choose resolve, and we must lead the world to meet this threat. Now, let's be clear about what we're facing. Beyond Paris, in recent days, we've seen deadly terrorist attacks in Nigeria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey and a Russian civilian airline destroyed over the Sinai. At the heart of today's new landscape of terror is ISIS. They persecute religious and ethnic minorities, kidnap and behead civilians, murder children. They systematically enslave, torture, and rape women and girls. ISIS operates across three mutually reinforcing dimensions a physical enclave in Iraq and Syria, an international terrorist network that includes affiliates across the region and beyond, and an ideological movement of radical jihadism. We have to target and defeat all three. And time is of the essence. ISIS is demonstrating new ambition, reach, and capabilities. We have to break the group's momentum, and then it's back. Our goal is not to deter or contain ISIS, but to defeat and destroy ISIS. But we have learned that we can score victories over terrorist leaders and networks only to face metastasizing threats down the road. So we also have to play and win the long game. We should pursue a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy one that embeds our mission against ISIS within a broader struggle against radical jihadism that is bigger than any one group, whether it's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or some other network. An immediate war against an urgent enemy and a generational struggle against an ideology with deep roots will not be easily torn out. It will require sustained commitment in every pillar of American power. This is a worldwide fight, and America must lead it. Our strategy should have three main elements. One, defeat ISIS in Syria, Iraq, and across the Middle East. Two, disrupt and dismantle the growing terrorist infrastructure that facilitates the flow of fighters financing arms and propaganda around the world. Three, harden our defenses and those of our allies against external and homegrown threats. Let me start with the campaign to defeat ISIS across the region. The United States and our international coalition has been conducting this fight for more than a year. It's time to begin a new phase and intensify and broaden our efforts to smash the would-be caliphate and deny ISIS control of territory in Iraq and Syria. That starts with a more effective coalition air campaign, with more allied planes, more strikes, and a broader target set. A key obstacle standing in the way is a shortage of good intelligence about ISIS and its operations. So we need an immediate intelligence surge in the region including technical assets, Arabic speakers with deep expertise in the Middle East and even closer partnership with regional intelligence services. Our goal should be to achieve the kind of penetration we accomplished with Al-Qaeda in the past. 
This would help us identify and eliminate ISIS's command and control and its economic lifelines. A more effective coalition air campaign is necessary, but not sufficient. And we should be honest about the fact that to be successful, airstrikes will have to be combined with ground forces actually taking back more territory from ISIS. Like President Obama, I do not believe that we should again have 100,000 American troops in combat in the Middle East. That is just not the smart move to make here. If we've learned anything from 15 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's that local people and nations have to secure their own communities. We can help them, and we should, but we cannot substitute for them. In New Hampshire, joined again by John Carl, our chief White House correspondent. Republicans starting to weigh in on this debate right now, and they're really zeroing in on national security. It has dominated this debate so far. Those comments from Hillary Clinton where she said, we're getting where we need to be on ISIS. Yeah, finally the, where we need to be. This is her, her exact words were, we now finally are where we need to be. She was talking about the fight against ISIS. That is something that the vast majority of the American public disagrees with. Why disapproval with the president's handling of the ISIS threat? Republicans are pouncing on it. Jeb Bush uh, responding with a tweet, no Hillary Clinton, we are not where we need to be in the fight against ISIS. One other thing that's interesting, though, about this whole debate, George, and the Republican response is the only Republican we've heard by name, the only candidate you pointed out was Donald Trump. I have not seen a single tweet from Donald Trump. People Nothing. were expecting radio, to be live tweeting tonight. Radio that's right. silence from Donald Trump on a debate where he has been mentioned and none of his rivals well, have he's been. He's going to have a chance to respond tomorrow yes. uh, on, this, on this But week. on this debate uh, as well, you saw Martha Press. Uh, Secretary Clinton on the issue of Libya at the end. Uh, she tried to point out some differences with Bernie Sanders, but this is something as well that is sure to be, we know for a fact, if she gets the nomination, a general election issue. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, 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 Libya was something that for a while, while she was Secretary of State, she thought was going to be her crowning achievement. She was one that led the fight internally in the Obama White House to intervene in Libya. She was the one who made the case internationally as Secretary of State. And it has, of course, become something of a disaster. Republicans have already pounced on this far beyond the Benghazi issue, the question of what has happened to Libya since the U.S. and Europe intervened. Okay, time now for closing statements. We'll be right back. ABC News live coverage of the New Hampshire Democratic debate will continue in a moment. Hillary Clinton's recent announcement that she's running for president surprised nobody and marked the countdown to the 2016 election. So what do we really know about Hillary Clinton? Well, Hillary originally rose to prominence as President Bill Clinton's wife and first lady of both Arkansas and the White House. Besides an embarrassing side role in her husband's alleged affairs, she played a very active part in the Clinton administration as an advisor and unofficial diplomat. She also pushed for health care reform, dubbed Hillary Care by conservatives, and championed the rights of minority women. Immediately after her stint as the first lady, Hillary won a seat in the New York Senate in 2000. During her time in office, she supported military action in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and in Initially voted in favor of the Patriot Act. However, she also voted against two massive tax cuts and ultimately opposed the 2007 troop surge in Iraq, calling for a slow withdrawal. One of her final acts as senator was voting for the 2008 bank bailout. In 2008, Hillary campaigned to be the Democratic presidential candidate, but lost out to Barack Obama after a heated and financially record-breaking run for both. Despite competition between the two during the campaign, President Obama appointed Clinton as his Secretary of State for his first term. She continued to champion women's rights and gay rights as global issues. She also played a significant role in the U.S.'s action during the Arab Spring, as well as the killing of Osama bin Laden. However, her biggest challenge was following terror attacks on a U.S. embassy in Benghazi, Libya, that ended with the death of four Americans. Clinton was widely criticized after assuming responsibility for denying additional security for the embassy before the attacks. In 2012, Hillary resigned as Secretary of State, as she had been planning to do since 2010. For the first time since 1979, she became a private citizen. Although that lapse in service clearly hasn't lasted too long. So far, she has already been criticized in her current campaign for using a private email address during her time as Secretary of State. But we know one thing about Hillary Clinton. She's been dodging public controversy for the past 36 years and will be no stranger to the coming fight for the presidency. The world of media and politics can be a really strange place sometimes. Over on Seeker, Evan took a look at why Republicans have no equivalent to Jon Stewart and The Daily Show. 
It's not like there's nothing about liberalism worth making fun of. Indeed, Stuart himself often takes liberals to task for the superficiality of their beatnik factions and the inability to assert their point of view or advance their agenda. Check that video out in the description below, and thanks for watching TestTube.